Hello, I'm Mitchell Boscoro, uh, SOS Outreach Director. Uh, the first part of our program, can we bring that agenda up? Uh, so I can let you know what we're going to be talking about today. Little technical difficulties here. Apologies. Let's try this once again. Excuse me, everybody. Excuse, Excuse, go ahead. Excuse everybody. Should we just go ahead with the first part of the program? We'll get that fixed. So the first part of the program is going to be a brief history of the Cairo facilities. It's going to be presented by Reverend Ray Fukumoto. It's uh, Save Our Seniors Network, Interfaith Network Director.
the original conviction, the original intent. How many of us would be willing to put our own homes up as collateral for the sake of our elderly? This is what two of the Cato founders did over 60 years ago, a commitment and conviction to benefit our ignored community and a need that continues to grow. What do we, the Japanese American community, feel about the 139 deaths and the disregard for our elderly now? All I can say is that we feel sick. Thank you. Our timeline was researched and created by Tracy Toshiyuki Kimura. January 2011. In January of 2011, Cato celebrated its 50th anniversary. They fundraised about 760000 from the community to continue the tradition of quality, bilingual, culturally sensitive senior care in their facilities. <clears throat> February 19, 2013. One of the original influential Cato founders, George Aratani, passed away. 37 days after his death, a task force was assembled by Cato to sell the four facilities. May 28, 2015, Cato has put in two requests already to the California Attorney General to sell their four facilities and property without community input. Kamala Harris finally approves the waiver. August 1, 2015, Ad Hoc Committee to Save Cato was formed. They later became Koresha. They organized petitions, speak outs, town halls, marches, and even filed a temporary restraining order to stop the sale. <clears throat> February 2016, escrow closes. Four Cato senior facilities are sold to Pacifica. We are given five years to protect our bilingual, bicultural facilities. And four months after ESCO closes, Sean Bianca retires with a $800,000 retirement package. Between 2017 and 2018, under the watchful eye of Pacifica, the patient care violations skyrocketed. They were up to 500% in KI South, South Bay nursing home. And they increased up to 300% at KILA. 18 months later, COVID-19 pandemic hits. <clears throat> September of 2020, Save Our Seniors Network was formed to inform the community the five-year conditional period was ending. January 26, 2021. Save Our Seniors Network held its first community rally at 325 South Whale Avenue in front of Sakana ICF. We are aware that Pacifica has filed for a land use permit to convert the Sakana ICF to market rate apartments. Two days after this demonstration, Pacifica responded to the rally and announced, quote, none of the current residents of the ICF will be evicted. Da, 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 da. Pacifica understands the ICF staff has been an extension of the family for the residents. Da, 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 da. And Pacifica remains committed to maintaining the staff that contributes so much to residential care. Cato published their statement praising Pacifica and yet several days later endorsed the eviction of the residents. March 2021, the number of COVID deaths at KILA makes the news. The facility has the highest death rate in California. May 19, 2021, first eviction letters are sent to ICF residents. August 2021, Pacifica closed Sakura ICF with plans to build market rate apartments and a parking structure. I'm done. The next part of our program is going to be remedies and reasons for features of the conditions of sale. Thank you, Laura, for laying out some of the critical dates and issues from the fight to save Cato seven years ago.
to the more recent struggles to save soccer and intermediate care facility, and the demands for justice to redress the breaches of the conditions of sale. In this next presentation, we'll focus in on our discussion, ongoing discussions with the Office of the Attorney General, starting with a timeline uh, of how we've gotten here. But first, it's important to put into context our discussions with the Office of the Attorney General as part of a larger goal of advocating for quality, bilingual, bicultural senior health care services and senior care facilities and the restoration of the Cato legacy. For much of 2021, SOS Network's campaign to pass AB 279 was a cornerstone of our efforts because its signing into law would have extended the conditions of sale of the former Cato facilities, preventing the closure of Sacramento ACF through July 2022. This campaign involved several community actions which continued throughout 2021. I hope you were able to catch the, eight, the ad we placed in the Rafa Shifo, which ran last Saturday, September 10th, that documents the number of these actions. Key to our efforts has been the commitment to engaging community, raising awareness of the issues, turning on the light, as Reverend Ray likes to say. That was our intention with the Rafa Shifo ad, and most certainly is our goal today. The path to the remedies and redress for the breaches of the conditions of sale started with our first request to meet with Attorney General Rob Bonta, who had just been appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom uh, in the spring of 2021. Appealing to A.G. Bonta's personal history as an advocate for the community causes, we wrote, two months ago at Governor Newsom's announcement of your nomination at the International Hotel, you spoke about your mother Cynthia Bonta's legacy as a community activist who quote unquote linked arms and formed a circle to protect those who were inside from being evicted, quote unquote, unquote. 45 years later, Saber Seniors Network is fighting the same battle against Pacific companies. Please be helped with slides. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Yeah, thank you. Um, 45 years later, Saber Seniors Network is fighting the same battle against Pacific companies, an international real estate developer who has aggressively set in motion their plans to evict very elderly, disabled, and frail Japanese American and Japanese seniors from their homes at Sakura Intermediate Care Facility located in the historic Los Angeles neighborhood of Boyle Heights. We didn't hear back from the Attorney General, not this time. But the lack of response did not deter us from continuing the fight to stop the evictions of the seniors of, at Sakura ICF. Throughout the months long legislative process, SOS Network coordinated with Assembly Elder Otsuchi. Uh, the author of AB 279 and his legislative director, California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform in Canada, and various community uh, organizations, where we directly lobbied state legislators to identify it as strategically important to the passage of AB 279. We participated as AB 279 supporters through the legislative committee meeting process while gathering support of the expert community at JA Community Events and Centers. By early September 2021, AB 279 was well on its way to the governor's desk, having to that point garnered an overwhelming and bipartisan 95% cumulative vote in favor of the bill, 95, 91 eyes to 10 votes through the California State Assembly and Senate. We in SOS Network were cautious and optimistic. But to our horror and dismay, on October 10, 2021, Governor Newsom vetoed AB 279. The last residents of Sac at, at Socket ICF had already transferred out some weeks before, but AB 279 had represented the last chance to extend the conditions of sale to July 2022 and could have possibly opened the way for Socket ICF to reopen. On November 2nd, 2021, we responded with a scathing open letter rebuttal to Governor Newsom's veto. It was at this point we decided to pivot back to the Attorney General and send our second request for a meeting. The issue had always been to seek remedy and redress for the breaches of the conditions of sale. At its core, the conditions of sale had to mean something. There had to be consequences if the conditions were not met. These breaches had long been documented and presented to the Attorney General by Cato Pacific Community Advisory Board, by Croatia, and most recently by SOS Network. There had been no meaningful response from the Attorney General until recently. On November 22, 2021, SOS Network made its second request for a meeting with the Attorney General, this time with endorsements from dozens of community organizations and concerned individuals. 
We believe this outpouring of community support and the urgency of the issue was critical in moving AG Bonta. Within five days of our request, the Office of the Attorney General responded, affirming AG Bonta's intention to meet with us. SOS Network immediately began preparing, putting in countless hours through the holidays. However, it was difficult to get on the AG's demanding schedule, and by late 2022, January, we were advised as such. But that AG Bonta had appointed Special Assistant Attorney General James Toma to meet with us on his behalf. If I may. The meeting finally took place via Zoom on February 24, 2022. Here we go, you can switch. Next slide. In attendance were more than 50 Save Our Senior Network members, family members of former Sagara ICF and KILA residents, and endorsing community organizations and individuals. There we go. I know it's difficult for me, but I had quite a few people endorsing and attending the meeting. Much of today's presentation is taken from the presentation we made at the February 24th meeting. Our presentation came to an hour at length, doing as we have done here, providing historical context to the issues, lifting up the families of the senior residents and their testimonials, and ultimately laying out 19 requests for remedy and redress for the breaches of the conditions of sale. At the end of our hour presentation, Special Assistant Attorney General Toma met with us for an additional 30 minutes sharing the sincere reactions and ultimately committing to ongoing conversations with SOS Network concerning the 19 requests. Since the February 24th meeting, we have met with SAAG Toma four times with a fifth meeting to be arranged soon. In these five meetings, five of the 19 requests, I'm sorry, the four meetings, uh, five of the 19 requests have been the focus of these discussions. These five requests for remedy and redress, uh, one back, sorry. There you go. Uh, include, number one, a lifetime assisted living waiver, which involves a commitment from Pacifica companies to continue the Medi-Cal waiver program for the lifetime of the six former Sakura ICF residents who moved to Sakura Gardens assisted living facility. You will hear more about, shortly, about the impact of this waiver program in one of our family member testimonials. Secondly, the right to return, which allows displaced Sakura ACF residents to return to the Sakura Gardens Assisted Living Facility and be extended the same lifetime assisted living waiver. SAAG James Toma took these to Pacifica and secured their agreement. It cannot be overstated the significance of this win and the step in the right direction of justice for our seniors, at least for those who are still in a position to take advantage of this opportunity. Third, we believe we have made a compelling case to SAAG Toma that Cato must honor its commitments under the terms outlined in the conditions of sale, in which Cato is obligated to contribute significantly from the proceeds of the sale of the four former Cato facilities towards providing bilingual, bicultural, residential health care services for seniors, and ultimately towards once again providing a residential uh, facility for bilingual, bicultural senior care. This is an ongoing discussion, but based on our conversations with SAAG Toma, there is indication Cato has responded by increasing their bilingual bicultural residential health care service offerings in the last year. There's still much our community can do to hold Cato to these commitments, and much still to discuss with SAAG Toma towards this end. Fourth, SAAG Toma has been presented with unrefuted evidence that Pacific companies did not meet its obligations to provide $1.2 million in community benefit services per the conditions of sale. SOS Network feels this is a slam dunk and expects a favorable outcome. Last but not least, fourthly, SOS Network has not relented in our demand for justice for the disproportionate COVID-19 death rates at KI Los Angeles, the facility dubbed by the LA Times as the state's deadliest nursing facility. While we continue calls for an investigation, a third investigation, we have shared with SAAG Toma a federal survey conducted by the Department of Health and Human Services and completed August 2021, which found KL, KILA, quote, failed to implement interventions, it's the next slide, failed to implement interventions to prevent and control the spread of COVID-19, putting KILA residents and staff at risk of infection with COVID-19 and becoming seriously ill, leading to hospitalization and or death. The federal inspection also found, quote, an immediate jeopardy 
for the facility's failure to implement measures to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 infection, which threatened the health and safety of the residents and staff. Yet despite these findings, there are still many unanswered questions and little more than slaps on the wrist for the 115 seniors who lost their lives to COVID-19 at KILA due to the negligence and greed of Pacific companies that put our seniors in danger. It is SOS Network's intention to continue to engage the community to join us in our demands for answers and for justice. Our ongoing meetings with SAAG James Toma will be a key to this process, as well as our work with Congresswoman Judy Chu, who's also looking into the issues and will be our keynote speaker at Control Home 3 in three weeks. We hope you'll join us uh, at the Jana Pavilion uh, in three weeks. That we are only focusing on these five of the 19 requests for remedy and redress at this time has been strategic. And while our collective efforts with the supportive community has yielded some wins, we still have much work to do. Thank you. The first two couldn't make it today, but they did make videos. These are recent videos. Uh, uh, these two families, uh, one was from KLA and the other was from Sakura ICF. So we're going to start with Margaret Miyauchi. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell my dad's story as a resident at KILA. My dad was a resident at Sakura ICF, but in May 2020, he needed to be moved to another facility. We were concerned about COVID cases at KI, but were assured that he and the staff that care for him will not have contact with COVID residents located in a secluded wing. We didn't have a choice but to move him there because there are no other facilities that can care for him in Japanese. When Dad was transferred, we tried to communicate with him as often as possible via phone calls and eventually having an echo show installed in his room over the summer. We could drop in on him and video chat with him regularly. My dad was misdiagnosed with COVID on December 4, 2020 and was going to be transferred to COVID section of KDI. KDI had inconclusive test results and with my request, a second testing found him to be negative. Eventually, he was diagnosed as having COVID. We were told that he was asymptomatic and doing well. During the latter part of December into January, my sister and I would call to see how he was doing. Not too long after he contracted COVID, we were not able to drop in on him on the Echo Show and would ask the staff to turn the, turn the device back on. They claimed it was broken, or they didn't know how to turn it back on. I ran into his primary physician, Dr. Matsumoto, and after a short conversation, was angered by the fact that K.I. lied to us about the seriousness of my dad's condition. The doctor informed me that dad was so ill, he needed to be transferred to a hospital. But the hospitals were full, and he could not be moved. The doctor thought death was imminent at that time and found it miraculous that Dad survived. K.I. lied about the seriousness of Dad's condition and covered it up by shutting off the Echo Show, the only mode of communication to see how he was doing. They didn't want us to see him wearing an oxygen mask. When we notified K.I. that we were taking him out, they made it difficult for him to be released to family immediately. These are just a few instances of KI's lack of care for their residents. I have other stories to tell, but for today, I just want to share some of the critical issues that existed for us to make the decision of taking Dad to, out of KI. Thank you for your time, and I hope this will help you on your decision to support SOS and their endeavors on helping our seniors. Michael Choji. 
Can we move on to my friends from Can we do that? My name is Francine Nimai. I am a former member of the Sakura Family Council, which I still support, and a volunteer for today our Seniors Network. To start, I would like to share some brief information of my family's history. Prior to World War II, my family owned Fukuyama Hardware, and now it is called J-Town or Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. After the war started, the government took everything from them their business, home, and whatever they had with the exception of what they could fit in a suitcase. At the time, there was my Jichan, Bachan, auntie, and uncle. They were sent to an internment camp in Gila River, Arizona. My mother's life started there in May of 1943. When released in 1945, they had nothing to go back to. Now I will share my heartbreaking experience due to Pacifica. My mother chose to reside at the Sakura Intermediate Care Facility at the end of October in 2019, right before the pandemic started. My mother suffered from dementia, Alzheimer, and was diagnosed as being bipolar. It took her a while, but she loved it there. She called it her home. She was very attached to Beverly Ito, the administrator, and her nurse, Andrea. As a matter of fact, Andrea would make her laugh so hard if I was on the phone with her, she would tell me she had to go and would hang up on me. It would make me laugh and smile that she had such a wonderful, strong bond with her nurse. She adored and loved Beverly and considered her as her daughter. I would pick her up and take her out to eat every week prior to the pandemic. She looked forward to our weekly outings. When the pandemic hit, we were no longer allowed to visit. My mother didn't understand why we couldn't have visitation and take her out. Fortunately, she loved Beverly and the staff. They became her extended family during this devastating time for her. God truly blessed her. She felt safe and cared for. I myself love Beverly and the staff and will be forever thankful and grateful that they took such loving care of my mother. Pacifica had assured us they would not close the facility while we were in a pandemic. The moment skilled nursing facilities were accepting new residents, we were asked to get prepared to have our loved ones relocated. We pleaded with them to keep the facility open at least until the pandemic ended. They would not budge. Please keep in mind, under the leadership of Beverly Ito, Sakura Intermediate Care Facility is the only facility we know that had a zero COVID resident case. With this being said, none of us wanted to relocate our loved ones. KI Los Angeles or South Bay have bicultural care, but had high COVID cases and death rates, so we would definitely not choose either facility. Many other skilled nursing facilities in the surrounding area had COVID cases and or deaths, but no bicultural care. We were not even able to tour the facilities to see if it was the right fit for our loved ones. We wanted to keep our loved ones where they would be safe, loved, and getting the same care they were receiving. There were no equivalent facilities. The outstanding care and love that Beverly Ito and her staff provided the residents could not be replaced at any facility. It pains me that instead of putting Beverly and her staff on a pedestal, Pacifica did not care if they had the only COVID fleet facility in the state or the best staff. They still shut them down. Please also note, I, I blame Cato for selling Pacifica knowing they had no interest in the residents. Due to my mother's condition, she became very depressed when she heard the ICF was going to close and she would have to relocate. She became fixated on this and stopped eating because she was constantly in fear she would have to leave her home. She said she was not leaving. I promised I would fight for her and do whatever I could to allow her to stay. She was very proud of my involvement with the Sakura Family Council and the Save Our Senior Network. Beginning June of 2021, I picked her up to have her relocated. She cried and she said she was going back to Sakura. She said, I'm not moving. I didn't give you permission to take me out of Sakura. I don't give a damn what you say. This was the most heartbreaking day of my life. After being relocated, she started going downhill very quickly. It didn't matter that we visited her every other day. She missed her home. She missed Beverly. Three and a half short months after being relocated on September 11th, 
2021, my mother passed. Had Pacific allowed the residents to stay at least until the end of the pandemic, I truly believe she would have had a much better quality of life in her final days. Many of our elderly Japanese were sent to or born in internment camps. Please join us to allow our elderly to live the remainder of their lives by not having their rights taken away from them again. They held a very big part in helping to build our country. All the elderly deserve to be treated with respect, love, and the best care in the, their final days, no matter if they are black, white, brown, red, or yellow. Thank you, Sakura Family Council and, and Save Our Seniors Network for honoring my mother's memory. To all those attending today, thank you for allowing me to share. God bless you. that they had the four facilities. So that would be KILA, KL South Bay, Sakura Gardens, or the Sakura ICM. So if any family, you can come up to the mic, uh, the mic will have the whole mic provided, and you can share it. Uh, it's right, it's right here. here. Oh, yeah, right, right here. here, I'm sorry. Okay, right here. So we're going to uh, go to Michael Toji. In August of last year, she was forced to move out of her home of almost 10 years due to the sale of the Kino facilities to a for-profit corporation, Pacifica Senior Living, also because of the subsequent closure of that ICF due to the sale. She was the last resident at that facility at the ICF. When it was time to consider senior care for my mother almost 17 years ago, the Kino facilities, which includes the ICF, the retirement home, and two uh, nursing care facilities, for the preeminent Japanese senior care facilities in Southern California, nothing came close. Due to its reputation of being founded by and serving the Japanese and Japanese American communities, there was no hesitation in moving there. My mother does not speak English, and the culturally sensitive nature of the facility and the staff were critical in our family's decision. The past five years between the announcement of the sale to the time when she was evicted for fraud and stress that arose from the uncertainty of her, of her future, especially during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. My mother intended to live out the rest of her life in an environment surrounded by family and duty, custom, friends, and Japanese-speaking staff. That security was taken away from her with the closure of the ICF. Imagine being 92 years old, not speaking English, and being told you were being evicted from your home. Imagine the worry and the anxiety of that situation. Despite the best efforts of my friends, family, and the community, an equivalent facility could not be found in all of Southern California. Sukura ICF was indeed a unique place. Thankfully, with the help and support of various advocacy groups and the community, the last remaining six ICF residents, my mother included, were able to negotiate her transfer to the assisted living portion of the Boyle Heights campus. A financial arrangement was reached with Pacifica, wherein our family would pay the same rate at the assisted living facility as she did when she was at ICM, with no cost increase. However, now that the conditions of sale have expired, Pacifica is under no obligation to maintain the culturally sensitive services that were the hallmark of its care. The most critical component will be the lack of Japanese speaking care staff. Again, my mother will be unable to accurately convey her medical needs and comprehend the instructions of the staff, which will certainly and directly impact her well being. This is not only a quality of life issue, but one of crucial medical care with accurate communication between residents and staff. I urge you to have Pacifica maintain the culturally sensitive and bilingual health care has been so critical in the care of my mother and, the, uh, and also in the care of other elderly seniors, many of whom are in their 80s, 90s, and beyond. 
and guarantee that Pacifica will maintain their financial assistance to the six remaining residents under their care. Thank you for your time. Share your experience. Kinsaka. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending today. Uh, it's an honor to, for us, the family members, uh, to share our experiences with you this afternoon. Um, I had a 94-year-old mother who was living at uh, Sakula ICF for about eight and a half years before her eviction. Um, just to give you a little background about my family, uh, my father is a Kibe Nisei, so uh, uh, my mother is a Issei, and uh, so uh, they met in Japan, well he was in Japan, and I was born there, and basically he immigrated back to his own country uh, in 1961, so um, <clears throat> my mother would have been 33 years old when she uh, immigrated at that point, so uh, lived a long life in the United States uh, as an Asian American woman. Um, and probably experienced a lot of hardship along that time. Uh, I can imagine now, uh, being now uh, much more older, uh, my life experiences. Um, so after her eviction, uh, she was uh, really forced to look for an alternate site to live, and we were finally decided to uh, relocate her to a, uh, uh, what we call a regular uh, skilled nursing facility, which would be uh, uh, not a culturally sensitive uh, facility. Um, and this meant really that all her day-to-day uh, -day pleasures, like uh, just the Japanese meals or having uh, caregivers that can communicate with her readily about her daily needs, health needs, would all be taken away, would be all gone by that point. Um, and so basically, um, uh, her cognitive, I think, abilities declined very quickly since then. And it was not necessarily because the facility was giving her poor care. Uh, I think they were doing the best they could, but it just wasn't the kind of care that Francine just mentioned about what was offered at Sakura and SCF. You know, the, the care there was just amazing, actually. Um, so, uh, and you can imagine that the needs for language capability being really important in a skilled nursing facility or an ICF because unlike something like a um, uh, ICU where you're dealing with a patient for six hours, three hours in a critical state, you're dealing with your residents 24-7 and they need to communicate with you all of their needs, whether it be minor daily needs or more serious medical needs and that's gone, that's taken away. And when, when that's done, uh, really what happens to, I think, the residents is they lose, actually, hope in a lot of ways. Because most of their caregivers now cannot communicate with them with, about even the most simplest issues. So uh, my mother suffered a fairly rapid cognitive decline. Um, and also, uh, the other issue with uh, the uh, difference between the ICF and the skilled nursing facility is that uh, in the skilled nursing facilities, of course, most of the pay, uh, residences are basically uh, wheelchair bound for a variety of reasons. They want to minimize falls, and they want to do all these other things to maintain control over the residences. Well, my mother was a very uh, active walker. She could very, walk very quickly in her walker uh, when she was at the ICF. So I, I noticed that decline very quickly in her, just physical decline her legs getting weaker. And of course, with physical decline, there's the attendant mental decline that follows that, or goes along with that. So all of these uh, 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 sort of declines that I saw in my mother is what I am actually struggling with today. Um, and um, so basically, since the time of her release from the ICF to now, about 15 months or so, she became what was a very active person with a walker, getting around at will to somebody that's basically wheelchair, a wheelchair bound. 
and is essentially uh, spends her, most of her time, I think, sleeping in her wheelchair. So uh, this is, a, I think, a really a very uh, painful experience to see. Uh, and if you have any loved ones that have gone through that, I, I think you all know what I'm talking about with this. Um, and I think one of the more pain, most painful things is that she probably really doesn't understand what has happened to her over the last two years. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. But at the same time, I know that there's some degree of anger and resentment toward me. Because I feel it. Of putting her in this situation and these changes in her lifestyle. So uh, it's been a very, very difficult uh, time for her, of course, but for her family as well in the last 15 months. Um, so what you've heard today were many powerful testimonials from my friends and colleagues who have their loved ones in these various facilities now. Oh, sorry, the various Cato facilities, KILA and the ICF. And it really speaks to a need for culturally sensitive bilingual facilities in our community. Um, Pacifica, unfortunately, clearly did not seek to maintain the ICF at levels that existed because uh, even simple hygiene uh, practices like taking showers, hot, hot water for showers, or hair care were curtailed often because of various problems in the facility, which could have been easily rectified, but they chose not to, or chose to prolong it before uh, the problem, before fixing it. Uh, there were noticeable decline in food quality during that period, unfortunately. And toward the very, very end of the last few months before eviction, it was very clear that there were subtle uh, pressures being placed on the residences and the families by some of the staff members to uh, resign themselves, essentially, for the eviction that was coming. Um, so you heard Michael Toji's testimony today, and his mother. Uh, imagine the situation where, for her, Mrs. Toji, the ICF was really a place for her to live out her days, her years. It was a comfortable place for her, uh, and it was a familiar place. And she expected that place to be her final home. Imagine, in a, less than a few months, most of the residences are now gone. And every time you uh, sit down and prepare yourself to sleep, the halls are empty. Imagine that. I mean, to a person who expected that to be her basically permanent home. After a few months, it's become a place where it's very lonely and also even frightening. Uh, to be there. And so in her last few days, uh, before Mrs. Toji was moved out, she begged her son, crying, to please take me out of the ICF. Because it was just unbearable for her, understandably so. So uh, these were some representative voices you heard today from us, from Francine, from Michael, and from um, uh, Margaret today. This is Represent, these are representative voices out of about 70 residents who watch, once occupied the ICF. So please remember that, that there were, uh, these kinds of stories were repeated many, many times uh, due to these evic the eviction. Um, so I just want to finish this by uh, saying that um, Many of the ex-ICF residents continue to uh, suffer after the eviction and relocation. You've heard about Francine's tragic story with her mother. Um, also, uh, you've heard about Mr. Miyauchi's experience at the KILA facility, where um, uh, the, this, the facility actually hid the seriousness of his, seriousness of his COVID. Uh, uh, illness. Uh, and so these are really all uh, matters that I think requires further investigation. And uh, SOS said it continues to strongly request the California Attorney General to investigate these uh, events 
that took place at these facilities. Um, Thomas Jefferson is quoted to have said, the measure of society is how it treats its weakest members. And I'd like you to think about how these profit corporations like Pacifica, uh, who run senior care facilities, are doing in this measure. Okay. Uh, thank you all for your interest today in the effects of the KRO sale to Pacifica, as well as the greater issue in front of us now of how elder health care will look for Japanese and Japanese Americans in the years to come. Please join us in reestablishing the culturally sensitive care that we are slowly losing. It will be a pleasure for each of us to meet with you after this forum and continue our discussion further. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone here, uh, a family member, would like to share anything? experience or testimony, uh, please come up to the mic right now. I'll skip if there's any other families in we're the house. We're still going to have... Are there any other families in the house? Yeah, any, oh, are there any families? Any families that would like to share their experience? We're still going to have the open mic at the end. And if you have anything... Speak for myself. Voices I heard. Can't hear them. It's close enough. <laughs> I heard the outrage and sadness seven years ago when Cairo sold the retirement home, the ICF, the Cairo Nursing Home, the South Bay Cairo Nursing Home, the Pacific Company, a for profit real estate company. Cairo decided to sell without a public hearing and not hearing our voices. Cairo did not hear other options before the sale, like finding another CEO who could keep the facilities open, yeah. like keeping ownership of the properties and contracting another management company to operate the facility as Pacifica has with North Star and Aspen. And did not hear the voices of our community to support the continuance of the Cairo facility. Cairo failed to engage the entire BK community. They divided us and created mistrust in Cairo's leadership. We are still divided. Cairo continues not to hear the voices of our seniors. After the sale, Sakura Retirement Home had difficulties providing quality Japanese meals and for, for a time unable to provide, provide meals at the cafeteria. It took months to repair the elevator, presenting a safety hazard for the residents. Pacifica raised the rent 5 to 6 percent annually, and now for many Nikkei seniors, the retirement home is unaffordable. After the sale, Aspen, the management company for KI Nursing Home, converted all the beds to Medicare transitional care. Transitional care pays about twice that of custodial care. I requested a custodial care bed for my 95-year-old patient under the care of his devoted and loving 88-year-old wife. As a consequence of preferring transitional care over custodial care, KI told me there were no custodial beds. My patient was placed on a waiting list. Eight months later, he died waiting. So this lack of custodial bed is a tragic national trend, all driven by profits. At the sale, KILA had mostly Japanese American residents, roughly 90%, and now it's about 30%. This reduction is due to the washout effect and the preferential admission of Medicare traditional care residents, who are mostly non-Japanese. Many of these transitional care residents stay on in custodial care. Because we're such a small minority, the Japanese American residents will eventually be washed out. KILA and South Bay KI may eventually discontinue any current culturally sensitive care. Without a facility uh, dedicated to the culture and language needs, 
needs of our Japanese Americans, our seniors will have to endure the isolation, the loneliness, and the psychosocial stress to adapt and survive in facilities unable to provide optimal care. Pacific announced the closure of the ICF when the Pfizer condition for the sale expired February 2021. A outrageous and heartless timing of eviction during the pandemic. SOS, Croatia Senior Care and Advocacy, a telephone advocates, advocates for nursing home reform, Buddhist temples, Nikkei Progressive, and many other community organizations and politicians like Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Judy, uh, Judy Chu, LA Councilman Kevin DeLeon, State Senator Maria Elena Zarazo, Assembly Person Miguel Santiago, Assembly Person Alan Ratucci asked Pacific on payroll to postpone the eviction of the ICF residents. Corey's attorney asked payroll to request Pacific and the Attorney General to stop or postpone the eviction during the pandemic. Pacifica and Cairo did not hear our voices. ICA residents were then transferred to various nursing homes and assisted living facilities. Hearing the voices of Horatia, SOS, and other organizations, Pacifica accepted several of the ICA residents under Medi-Cal exemption to the Sakura Retirement Home. Other ICA residents went to KI nursing homes during the pandemic, despite knowing that KILA was a COVID designated facility accepting COVID infected patients from local hospitals and had the highest COVID mortality rate in the state of California. The ICF had no COVID deaths. After the eviction, the majority of the ICF residents who were Japanese speaking lost access to Japanese speaking caregivers and the culturally sensitive care. With no facility dedicated and catering to the needs of Japanese Americans, we will all suffer this fate. Cairo, hear the voices of your seniors. Cairo, honor your original mandate to provide affordable and culturally sensitive long-term care facility for the Nikkei community. We need a non-profit facility dedicated to the cultural language needs of our Nikkei seniors. We need a facility where we can self-determine our own health, welfare, and happiness. Cairo has the funds to build it now. Cairo also has the option of providing the building funds to another community organization, like the Little Tokyo Service Center, to build it. Cairo can heal and lead in uniting our community. Thank you. I am a fourth generation constituent of Boyle Heights. I am Yonsei. Uh, my uh, mother grew up here uh, along with my grandparents on Chicago Street. And Bachan was also a resident years ago at Cairo. I am here in support of the seniors, the families, the community, SOS, and everyone here who has a heart and passion for our seniors who have been treated unjustly and inhumanely, all because of profit over life. And this basically is history repeating itself 80 years ago when our families were uprooted and taken to concentration camps in 1942 at the orders of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, I'm here to talk about the importance, as many of you, our speakers today, talked about the importance of cultural sensitivity, cultural proficiency, and cultural um, competency, the three C's. These are three important components that our loved ones need, and especially as we age in the society. In this country, we are not prepared to take care of our, our loved ones, and this is a prime example of what has happened. Backroom deals with developers without having us at the table to decide what we want. 
uprooting our families like they are animals. We are repeating history again. This is a lack of care and tactics of intolerance, racism, rejection, injustice, and violations that have caused our families stress, anxiety, depression, PTSD, confusion, and fear. As many of you, thank you, as many of you have, have stated today, it is very important that as we age, we age in a, a place where we can relate to that has culture and belief systems, language, values, religion, food, music, activities, literature. This was ripped away from our people. And we must unite together in solidarity to put pressure and be vigilant on the next steps forward. SOS has done exactly that. Save our seniors. We are not going away. We are not going to put our heads down in shame. That is over with. We are here. And we must rethink, reevaluate, rewrite history, as Howard Zinn said. I am appalled at Cairo. I am appalled at the fact that they didn't take our people into consideration in making any of these decisions at all. At all. Along with Pacifica and the politicians at the local state and federal level. I give grace and homage and, and support to those politicians like Judy Chu and Maxine Waters who have stood with us and have advocated for us from day one. So in ending my presentation to you, I want to all of us to remember, please, we must join with our brothers, as Francine Emai mentioned, whether we are red, black, brown, white, yellow. We are the force of this humanity to stop this injustice. We need to set precedents for the Japanese Americans who have been treated like animals. It will not happen anymore. This is 2022. 1942 is not that long ago, and we are smart, and we are bright, and we each of us have a story to tell about what happened to us. So in ending this, cultural competency means being aware of your own cultural beliefs and values and how these may be different from other cultures, including being able to learn about and honor the different cultures of those you work with. Cultural proficiency is the ability to understand the beliefs and values of people from a different race and or ethnicity. Cultural sensitivity is being tolerant of the diversity of people and placing no judgment on their values and belief systems with the intent of changing them, their environment, and or their way of thinking and living. Being culturally sensitive means recognizing and respecting their worth regardless of their background. We must continue the fight. Thank you, Dr. Diaz. And now we're going to have David Moncala of Save Our Seniors Network. He's our co-chair. Hi, my uh, part of the presentation is uh, called Follow the Money. It's basically six quick facts to help you see the bigger picture. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I'm trying to do my best. Uh, <clears throat> number one, national healthcare expenditure is $4.1 trillion. $4.1 trillion. It's about 20% of gross domestic product in the United States. That's healthcare. So in other words, one out of five money spent is spent on healthcare somewhere. 
And then, by the way, last year, in 2021, the top 10 corporations, they made a billion dollars a piece. They're the billion dollar club. That would include Kaiser, Tenet, Hospital Corporation of America, that's HCA, and University of Pittsburgh Systems. They each made over a billion, including their nursing home component. Second point, point is that for-profit versus non-profit. When people spoke about payroll being sold to for-private developers, this continued the trend in the last 30 years. Today in California, 77% of all nursing homes are for-profit. 30 years ago, it was kind of like the other way around. Nonprofits provide better, safer care based on 82 different studies. And in fact, there's an 18% difference in the death rate in COVID between nonprofits and for profit. How much reimbursement do they get? This is something to remember. Again, follow the money. Nursing homes like Pacifica receive from the government. Okay, here's what they get Medicare low income people, people of color usually, 200 to 250. Medicare, 600. COVID patients, 800 to over 1,000 per day. And in hospitals, they get a one lump sum statement. Regular pneumonia, you get five grand. COVID pneumonia, 13. If you put them on a ventilator, even for one hour, right before they die, that's 40 grand they get. 40,000, one patient. Politicians and healthcare companies. In California, in the last 10 years, $10 million was spent from 2012 to 22, given to California legislator, legislators from nursing home industry lobbyists and other donations. Mostly Republicans, but a good number of Democrats. Annually, nationwide, $47 million is spent by uh, lobbyists. There's 659 registered. There's only 435 members of Congress. The Japanese elderly population, Japanese have the highest number of seniors. It's 19% than any other race in the U.S. There's 1.2 million Japanese in the U.S., about 100,000 in LA County. There's a higher proportion of Japanese-speaking seniors who are on Medi-Cal. You have to have like 1,300 a month uh, for that and need bilingual services. The UCLA study shows that Southern California Bay Area has the highest concentration of Japanese Americans who need nursing homes. I'm one of the 43 million baby boomers who care for their elderly at home. Uh, that's one out of four of us. My mom is 99, and my stepdad, James, is 96. He's currently in a nursing home with COVID, but I'm the primary caregiver. COVID deaths. In California, COVID deaths is 10,000. One, one out of every, out of eight lived in nursing homes out of that 10,000. One out of eight. Okay. Now, if you compare, and this is an important point, I think, that we can all remember about this uh, tragic, tragedy. Uh, in California, the Jewish Homes, it's the largest nonprofit that provides this type of service. They have 4,100 deaths. Again, 4,100. They had three deaths in the same time period that we're talking about. The California Veterans Administration, CalVets, they have 2,100 deaths. They have three deaths in the same time period. Pacific of Facilities, 133. Uh, that's uh, 18 at uh, KI uh, South Bay and 150 at KILA. That's a total of 398 beds. So a total of 398, 133 beds. And I leave you with those numbers. Thank you very much. So uh, now we're going to have an open mic here, or you know, if it goes too long, we'll go to the Zoom people that are on Zoom. And uh, we're going to ask you to just walk up to the mic here, and if, there, if there's on ask a question to anyone on the panel, uh, including Easy, Montevallo, who talked about the remedies and retrust. Uh, ask any of us that present the program, you can ask us a question. So do we have anybody here that uh, would like to make a statement? Uh, we have the mic right here. And, uh, I know Mo here. Go ahead, Mo. My name is Mo Mishida, and 
and uh, I'm 86 years old, so I figure I'd like to put my voice out today. Uh, I want to thank everybody that made this uh, event possible, and especially the, the people who represent the families and the people that got, got turned around. And I want to speak to that people standing up right now. Right, we're going against our tradition, right? All that BS from feudal times. We don't need that. For the 21st century, and uh, if we're going to make a better world, then we need to stand up and make that damn world. Um, what I want to uh, make a statement about is we are always concentrating on the victims, and rightly so. But the perpetrators who set all this up, right, are going scot free, right? Nobody's planning a light on them. Nobody's saying, hey, look, there goes those traitors. There goes those people that don't have respect for our culture and our elders, right? And I, I want to emphasize, right, that anybody who's done any studies on gerontology knows, old people, knows that you can't go around and stir shit up with them, right? People have struggled all these years just to stay alive in this country, right? So they, they deserve some little peace and quiet, right? And yet, right, Sean Miyake and Diane and all those people who made up that transition team at Cairo, right? went ahead and did it. Now we need to ask them, is this what you call a benefit for our people? You know? Another thing, right? There's a lady right, who's the vice president of this country, right, who stuck her finger, her nose into our business. When we formed the ad hoc committee, right, she called, Kamala Harris called Charles Igala and told him, that we had positions on this community advisory board that she was making. And that community advisory board was supposed to help us, right, make this transition so we wouldn't be in this fix right now. That's what I believe that it was there for, right? And so what's going on, right? How come these people ain't answering? I mean, she's going to Japan to be at Abe's uh, funeral or something like that, right? That was in the rough Shinpo. Well, when she comes back, why don't we call on her, come to LA and answer some questions from us? So she stuck her nose into our business, right? And gave Cairo, right, the right to not have, uh, right, those community meetings where we could have voiced ourselves. You know, we have that right. So they had to make a sub submit a special waiver right to the AG's office so that they didn't have to do that. Well, we're going to ask you to okay. Okay. Please. All I'm saying is that, you know, there are other ways of looking at the problem. And uh, I hope we will take up some of those other ways. We're going to limit uh, comments to one minute. Okay, but the question is that Kamala Harris waived the public hearing. Okay, uh, they're supposed to be required by the California State Constitution that a public hearing, whenever a, a, a non Harris waived it. Okay, and the second part about most things, she got that denied. That's a Japanese term, it can't be helped. And that was something used a lot during World War II when we were going to the camps. A lot of the Nisei, the Nisei, she, she got the uh, Who do we have here? I have kind of a quick question, but let me, let me, let me correct that as well, because you have to also understand that Cairo requested that waiver. Okay? Cairo wanted that waiver to prevent us from being hurt. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah, in 2016, Sean Miyake uh, sold uh, Cato to Pacifica for, was it $73 million? And, uh, uh, Kate, and then they 
took that money and formed the KI, and they've been digging in and out. Uh, uh, I don't know how, how that works. Uh, and that basically, that's my question. Uh, how are they divvying it out, and uh, and uh, uh, how much is left, and uh, uh, that that sort of thing. Uh, David, since you are good at numbers, uh, could you answer that for me? How much is in there now? Uh, total assets are eighty-four million. How much is in there now? Total assets are eighty-four million dollars they have. Eighty-four million. Uh, according to uh, according to IRS nine ninety-four. So what happens? They got the. Uh, 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 interest it went up in capital gain investments. investments. Oh, okay. And then so, uh, uh, so how, how does uh, could can we use somehow get that money from KI and, and use or part of it to buy a facility? Sounds like a good idea. Do you mean okay, so so uh, how how, the, how does that work? I, I'm taking up too much time. No, no. We, we have to have a lot of people first. Let me add to that uh, financial status of Cairo when they did sell the place. Yes, they received 41 uh, as a bid, although ultimately I think it was 37 that they actually got. But you have to also understand that they had already 30 million in the bank. They were not going broke. Okay? So they had no financial reason to sell the place. How is K Roll returning some of the money? I hear about lunches, a lunch program, and they also have a senior, uh, a senior program, you know, three or four times a year. But uh, David, Dr. Tacker, anybody uh, on the panel, uh, how, how is K Roll returning the money, using the money, and, and are they meeting the conditions that they promised to? Yeah. Well, so far, not one penny has been spent on residential health care, except I think. Um, Lately, they might have done some entertainment, but they might have spent some money on entertainment at, uh, at some of the relocation facilities. That was the only thing that, that we're aware of. Uh, someone has their hands on. Okay, uh, no, we have to go in line here. She was in line first. Thank you. Hi, can I have um, permission from the seniors in the room to speak freely? Because I'm quite compassionate about you know what I'm about to say, so I don't want to learn out something. So if it's okay if we speak freely, can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Please talk to the camera. To the camera, okay. Um, I am absolutely freaking outraged. Um, this is not specific to the Asian community. This is not specific to um, the black community. This is not specific to the white community. This is uh, specific to the marginalized communities. And we absolutely have to be outraged we absolutely have, have to be vigilant, we absolutely have to be bold, and we have to, absolutely have to be radical, and we have to act now. These are seniors that we're dealing with, they are our most vulnerable members of the community, and we absolutely have to do something radical right now. My name is Ms. Italy, I'm here by way of J-Town Action Solidarity, and um, when you guys are looking for a gorilla to beat down the building, you have Jazz come and get Ms. Italy. Okay. <laughs> They'd be an outrage. They'd be on the streets. They'd be calling uh, legislatures to do something to act. Absolutely. Or if they, if their parents, their grandparents got evicted out of a out of a home, you know, they question me. Says, what is it about the Japanese American community that that they don't want to fight? You know, and and I say there is an organization that is fighting, and it's, it's Save Our Seniors Network. You know, we're doing our best, and, and we're planning more activity. But that's something to ask. You know, among the Japanese Americans that are here today, you know, uh, why can't we fight? Why, you know, we should be able to fight too. But anyway, that's up to each of us as individual. Uh, do we have anybody else that has some questions? Or might want to make a comment? John, did you want to say um, something? Yeah, I love this tax form. Yeah, I love this tax form for the, you know, how. Oh, yeah. 
this way. All right, so I looked at the tax forms uh, for how they spent the money, and they didn't have one for the last, I think, year or two. I mean, they had, the, well, they had one, and they dispersed about $250,000 mainly to, you know, like lunch programs and stuff like that for seniors, and some um, classes, and then also some money to churches to like improve their PA or something like that. And it was kind of like way diverging away from healthcare. It was like, yeah, there was no healthcare in there, right? food, you know. So that's what I got. Out of, out of what, $80 million? Yeah. 250000 right? Yeah. You know, that, that's a good point. And, and uh, I know in the presentation, uh, it was mentioned that, uh, that the Japanese community, Japanese American community is owed $1.2 million. David, can you kind of break that down? Was there a promise made in the conditions that, that uh, k Roll and or Pacifica are supposed to make donations? Yeah, they're not donations uh, because uh, whenever you transfer from a, a non-profit to a private, you know, people lose benefits. So in order to compensate for that, what they did was they, they required, the Attorney General required uh, Pacifica to pay $237,883 uh, every year uh, to the community groups. And uh, there is no record of this that it ever happened, and there's no record that it ever been paid. So, so that's where the one point two million comes from. It's two two hundred thirty seven thousand dollars times five years. So what Save Our Seniors is, is doing is we're demanding that they show open the books to let us know where they spent the money, if any. If they're short, they need to make up for it because it's in the conditions that they agreed to. One of the things that really got me angry over the span of time after they sold the place was the fact that they gave $1.7 million to Providence uh, Palliative Care System. Now that guy really makes me angry because Providence is a multi-million dollar health care delivery corporation, okay? Now why are you payroll giving them that kind of money. It should be the other way around. <laughs> uh, if you could, uh, you know, share your name or, or organization that you come from, if you, if you can. But go ahead. My name is Doris Oskawa, and uh, I'm a member of this church, Rachel Kosekai. And I'm So I, I just add, wanted to ask a question because I am a little bit confused. So now it's, it's okay. It's because you're Oh, um, so are they going to build another facility, or are they just throwing money out for food and entertainment and things of that sort? Why can't they build another facility to house the Japanese American seniors? so they feel comfortable like they did before. Over the past seven years, Corey's Senior Advocacy as well as SOS uh, have urged payroll to change their minds, to consider rebuilding, okay? And they have not heard our voices yet. They decided that they're out of the business and it's going to stay that way, as the current board of KRO had decided. So unless there's a change in the board of directors at KRO, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Uh, Matsumoto on the first part of it. But, uh, but currently, right now, I feel a little different because uh, this is all pre-COVID. And COVID just exposed every flaw and every weakness. And just and and, and I think after quoting uh, Cairo, back to Pacifico, back to the eviction, just and promised everybody, no one's gonna be evicted. They promised people no one's gonna be evicted. And look what happened. Okay. So after COVID and after this, I think it's a new day. And I think that that uh, the community's strong appeal to them may have a different result, hopefully. Okay, so, 
can I ask another question? So are, are we pushing? I mean, this the silliness of just throwing money for lunch and a little bit of entertainment is really it, it's not beneficial. I mean, are we are we legally holding them to the fire to do something to bring back a facility? for the Japanese Americans so they feel comfortable. I've had several friends or members of this church who go into temporary care and because they break their hip or whatever and they're eating food that they don't like. I bring in Japanese food for them to eat because they're eating food that they don't usually have in their diet, you know? So it would be nice to have, not only for the Japanese community, but for all other races to have a facility that focuses on their, on their ethnicity, you know? Let me just talk about, you know, uh, let me tell you, Cairo has $84 million. Okay, people could continue to contribute thousands of dollars every month to Cairo, even after the sale. It's not their money. We have to demand that they return that money. If it means getting a new facility, then we do it. Okay, Pacifica is running that facility at a profit right now. Okay, uh, the people at Carroll said we're losing money. No, Pacifica is making money right now. If we open a new facility, we can, we can make money and still serve the community. Uh, Easy Maldonado has something to share about that. Yeah, I'm sorry, was it Doris? Doris, thank you so much for reminding us. Uh, we are very remiss to, uh, we have not acknowledged Michoko Sakai here today. No, thank you very much. Uh, Michoko Sakai has been a staunch supporter and partner with Save Our Seniors Network uh, throughout the last year and a half. And we've had several events here now, uh, this wonderful space that we have here to gather uh, for this very important uh, meeting. Um, so again, uh, thank you. Please do thank the Michel Kosekai staff and members here. And I think we have another speaker coming up here, Mike Sampson on the board of Michel Kosekai. He's going to address us next week. If we can help in making a difference and gathering people, that's what Michel Kosekai is about. So if we can do that in any way, we're on board, okay? Yeah. So. So my name is Mike Sonson. Um, no, Risho Kosakai is with Save Our Seniors all the way, but I wanted to say that the founding Risho Kosakai Reverend of the Los Angeles Church, she passed in the Cable Building in 2015. Her granddaughter was my wife's lifelong friend. Um, my wife is a lifelong member. My wife works at this church. She works here, and um, her office is about 30 feet away, just on the other side of the wall right there. But we, we support you all the way, and as I said, the founding reverend of the Los Angeles Church 64 years ago, Mrs. Nakamura, died in Cairo in 2015, and my mother-in-law was supposed to go in Cairo, and she died before she could, before she could. but we, we support you all the way, and uh, Doris's questions are very valid, and there's, there's much more to say and much more to do, but the fight continues, and uh, we're with you guys, so thank you. <laughs> And he's here today. If you see him, you know, uh, please introduce yourself. So, once again, we really appreciate the you know, uh, facility and the small brigade for Michel Coastal County. Uh, any more questions? Uh, do you want to make a comment, Dr. Nadine? Yes, is it working? It's working. Thank you, Tachi. Um, in, in response to, to Ms. Doris, I think you made a very important point, and I think it's, it's very critical and imperative that we understand that in this country, every day in America, 10,000 people turn 65 years of age. And, and we are the fastest growing population of all races and ethnicities, and we, we don't have the policies in place at the federal level at the national level. Uh, we need to all work together and, and demand that our legislators start creating a legislation. We can create legislation. We don't need politicians. We, we are the community. And, and we need to push our legislation and advocate for what is needed 
from a, a cultural competency point of view, sensitivity and proficiency. So I am totally with you and all of you in terms of moving forward and, and creating the legislation that is um, empathetic and also sensitive to the needs of all people. Thank you. Come forward to your uh, Hello, my name is Henry Adelke. I'm a member of J-Town Action and Solidarity. Uh, so my question is, well, it seems to me, hearing the history of Cairo, that Cairo was really founded by the community, not by any one individual. And it would seem to me that Cairo would belong to the entire community and shouldn't be controlled by a small board. So I wonder, are there any avenues for us as a community to take democratic control of Cairo as opposed to just having to ask this small little board of people uh, to please do something for us? Is there an avenue for us to have direct control over those funds as opposed to asking them to maybe be nice to us and not sell out our people? David, uh, can I Yes, I'm sorry. Can I just add a comment, please, uh, on the discussion that's been going on? I think they're really relevant, central to this meeting. And Doris, thank you again for raising it. Um, the point I wanted to make is that uh, as was mentioned earlier by John, I believe, you know, Carol may make a uh, quarter of a million dollar donation and grants to various uh, local temples and organizations, community centers, etc. But they get, every time they hold these bento events, they get money through donations. And the total donations they get out of the year uh, is much more than what they put into the community in these kinds of events. And you have to also remember, that uh, they have, um, they, I think the really the only, they have tremendous connections with the board members of Kiro also are board members of other prominent organizations in the little Tokyo, community, little Tokyo community, in the Japanese American community. So there's this network that exists, which makes it hard to, in other words, uh, it's hard for other local organizations in the JA community to, to go against Cairo because of these connections, I think. So these are things that we have to become aware of. But the point I really wanted to make was, as was just mentioned by Mitch, uh, donations continue to come from the community to Cairo because of the legacy of all these years of service that they've shown, right, up to recently, up to before the sale. So the community isn't aware of what has happened to that group. But they continue to donate every year to it. So there's a part of a sort of a consciousness change that has to take place, I think, within the Japanese American community about that organization. So thank you. So they came, so I go, this is my aunts and uncles. Okay, they're in their 90s. And they're they don't they live, they take care of themselves. But we go to a Monterey Park senior. Japanese senior event every month, and they were there, and I was so, I didn't know anything about them. I was like excited, they're here to offer health care and all this other stuff and all these other programs to a bunch of seniors, and I didn't know that they were the ones, you know, keeping all this money and they're just throwing it out. So I'm shocked. Because here I am, I'd say, well, you should come to my church. <laughs> because I've got a lot of Japanese people here. Because they don't speak very good English, you should come to our church and talk to them. I'm, I'm so, I feel um, blinded by their, their, their methods. Um, I don't know if you guys want to come to the Monterey Japanese Senior Center, there's like over 250 members there, right? I don't know. I mean, it's kind of sad that I'm coming to realize that that organization that I was so excited about is doing all this. And people aren't aware of it. So I'm, I'm Dr. just Dr. You want blown to away. I'm sorry. You, want to you know, the initiative by Carol, take their money and at the same time ask them to build a nursing home. After this one comment, we're going to move on to the Zoom, um, the Zoom audience. But go ahead, sir. 
Good afternoon. I uh, apologize that she was close. My name is Theo Henderson, and I have uh, been on the house for many years, and I created the podcast for this. And the reason why I'm prefacing this is that what I've noticed is, especially of activists, and I applaud the conversation and the movement that's going on. But I do know that there has been a group of community members, elderly, that has been remiss in many communities, that, and that is the Asian community that is unhoused. And I wish to, this same energy to be employed to remembering that not everybody has families that can put them in Cairo, that the same activism and the same kind of energy is to look at, they still are your seniors. And the difficulty and the reality many times that they go to other cultural, other racial services because of the stigma of being unhoused. So I wish, and I'm glad that this is a conversation, and one of the things I also know as an African American person, when I see sometimes when other cultures see us protesting and blame it, like we are just whining or complaining, the reason we do this is because we know how insidious and how dangerous it is to keep our heads down because they're not going to stop. And I'm glad to see that this is starting to resonate around the community. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot your name, Maria. 
Nadine, how Nadine was saying about like, you know, the boomers are gonna be the biggest, and I think they're right now the biggest population. And so I think that this could be a story that really pushes like what a lot of people are dealing with when it comes to senior living. Um, the fact that, you know, it's owned and it's not really community owned. And like what Henry was saying is like seeing what, what it means to be community owned versus expecting another profit or another nonprofit to take place or another CEO because like it's just not going to work like that. And I want to let you guys know you guys are not alone. There's a lot of people here who are not afraid to show up to people's houses, who are not afraid to protest, who are not afraid to get out. So if you guys want to do the, the you know, you want to do certain parts of it, and then let's say you want to like tell some other folks, yo, this is the address, like can you go over there? Like we're more than happy to do that. Um, I also want to say that right now is really a time of revolution. And there is multiple things happening in our country that people are standing up for. You know, um, I'm part of the activist community here and we're really pushing for like people to stop stigmatizing unhoused people. You have people really fighting against LA City Council. And so I just encourage you that in this moment, we are in revolution. Don't be afraid to do whatever the F you want to like speak out and really say the truth. Because that's the only way we win, is by saying the truth, by exposing the system, and by your beautiful numbers, which did a great job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to have David more comments when we close many bars. But I do want to remind you that October 8th, we're going to be at the Japanese American National Museum, Museum for the Kanchal Bone 3. And for those of you that don't know what the board is, it's a celebration of those that passed in your family. You know, so, but we're we just uh, and covered it up. Uh, families had a horrible time looking for bilingual high culture care all over Southern California afterwards. Families have been here uh, no more bilingual high cultural care and witnessed their loved ones um, in some cases not caring about deteriorating. Um, we found that. Pacifica took steps to, to reduce the low income bedding on beds, uh, bring on custodial beds. Uh, and here, you know, uh, it's a clue to it. You know how they say systemic racism? A lot of times people just throw that around. But what it means is that, you know, nobody, no one person is a bad guy. <laughs> it, because the numbers do the discrimination. $200 reimbursement for bedding town, that's most of people of color. So, what hospital executive? is going to keep them when they can get $1,000 for having a COVID person come in, right? Exactly. Now, did that person do anything illegal? No. Was anybody did anything illegal or racist? No. But is it racist? Absolutely. It's absolutely racist. That's what systemic means. Um, we found that, um, you know, we need payroll to return our money back to the community. We need that 1.2 million in Pacifica as a start. And most of all, we need justice, and we need reparations, and we need unity and solidarity to get this done so that we can get Kiro aboard, and we can get Pacifica, and all these other corporations that threaten us from the day. So we'll see you in the world, and hopefully on October 8th and beyond. Thank you so much. So you can ask any one of us, any of our seniors or any of the teachers, any questions that you may have. And uh, Ray, Reverend Ray has an idea. We'd like to have a group photo. 15,000 Japanese Americans that live in the South Bay as guardian of Torrance in the South Bay area. And like Dr. Nadine said, we're the largest, you know, the seniors, the largest population. So keep in touch with us. Please enjoy the refreshments.
smile. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, Next up. Okay, what, right, what, what about you, Gideon? Oh, yeah, you need to get in. You can share a photo. Let me do it. Oh, you're doing this guy, Gideon. Yeah, June. Okay. Okay. Hey, wait, wait. Easy. Hey, hold it. Easy. Hold it. If, you, if we can have him shoot. Yeah, no, we can. 